the thing is that if we solve a problem here in the business, then chances are there are going to be lots of other people around the world looking for the, a way to solve that same problem. Hi Elementors, in this video I go in depth with Troy Dean of WP Elevation as we discuss growing your business as a WordPress professional and other topics as well. Thank you for having me on, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Well, I have so many questions and uh, I also got a few questions from our community, so I want to jump right in. Uh, Let's do it. We, do that, we, we kind of, I think our story, how we met is, is kind of funny because I actually totally cold cold called you uh, try to get in your uh, podcast because it's, it's such an amazing uh, program that you're running. Um, and later you started making videos about Elementor, to my mm. surprise. So can you tell me how did that uh, develop? Yeah, so, uh, you, so it's really interesting because I had only recently discovered Elementor um, before, and I kind of knew of it, but I hadn't used it. And so I started using it and instantly I was impressed with its uh, ease of use and, and the power and the flexibility of it. And so, you know, it's kind of funny when you start going down a rabbit hole, um, everything in the universe kind of seems to conspire to help you on that journey. Um, my, my wife is a psychologist and she calls it, they, they call it the attention bias. So if you buy a new Volkswagen, all of a sudden you're driving around and all you see is Volkswagens everywhere, right? Um, and so I discovered Elementor, I was using it, I was playing with it, and then you reached out and you, you said, hey, I think I'd be a good guest on your podcast. I'm like, this is perfect timing. Um, I had you on the show and then I just wanted to start, uh, in the interest of complete transparency, I wanted to start teaching our team internally here how we could start using Elementor to do some things on our website that we'd been wanting to do. One of the big problems that we were trying to solve internally here was the, the speed of iteration between us having an idea, getting it designed, and then actually deploying it on the website would take, could take you know, 10 days to two weeks. And that's just because we're a slightly larger organization now that I, I literally am not allowed to log into the WP Elevation website and start installing plugins or doing things because I generally break stuff. Um, and so the team have locked me out. So I saw Elementor as a way of going, wow, this is going to be such a great way for us to quickly iterate on ideas. And, um, and so then I started making videos to show our team how we could use Elementor to do some things. And also I wanted to really... I wanted to produce the highest quality WordPress training videos that I'd seen. So we've got a lot of equipment here and a great studio and a, and a, and a, and a great videographer, nice cameras, nice lenses. I wanted to do something that was just a little bit over and above the usual screen flow that everyone was kind of used to. And so we just, and I said, well, I'm going to start by, you know, showing people how to use Elementor to train our team and then we'll just share it on YouTube. And then we started sharing it with you guys. And, um, and that whole thing is now kind of snowballed into its own, uh, its own beast. And, uh, and we're producing those high quality how-to videos on a regular basis now. Yeah, well, you're exploding. Uh, I mean, in, in YouTube, you, you, the rate that you're producing new material and follow up what's, what's current is, is really amazing. And I think it's a good, it's something that uh, it, it's true, of course, to companies that are starting to be bigger like yours, but also to s small you know, freelancers and agencies that are just starting out and they need to be as relevant as possible because that's how they compete with the big companies. Yeah. So, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, and, and the thing I've always adopted this approach that if we, if we, if I'm going to make a video to train one of our team members, how to do something, then I may as well make that video the best I can make it and share it with the, with the wider community because if, if my team member wants to know how to do that, then there are going to be thousands of other people that want to know how to do it as well. So why just make a video for internal purposes? We may as well just record it and publish it. In fact, we just spent the afternoon at our branding agency's office uh, on the other side of town here in Melbourne doing a two-hour workshop on, on how, our, how our messaging is going to change moving forward as we change our business model here at WP Elevation. And so we took our videographer along with us and we all put microphones on and we filmed the whole workshop and he's going to cut that up into a series of you know, videos. And we're going to share that with our community because um, I want the rest of our team to see the workshop and also want all of our customers and I want you guys, I want all of our partners, I want the whole WordPress community to see what we're doing here. 
um, that's for me, that's always been the way I've learned is I, I, I learn out loud and I think it's a great way to learn because it, it forces you to really up your game and it keeps you accountable. And if you do it in public, then you kind of can't, you can't pull the wool over your own eyes for very long. You know what I mean? Because you're publishing it out there on the internet. Yeah, I think it's for us, it's a, it's a huge, what you're talking about is like, I would categorize it like uh, whatever you're already doing, like publish it to your audience and make it something that is uh, something you're marketing. So I think for us, it's, it's, you know, feature releases. We release a feature we're working on. We're going to document it and make our marketing around it. And I Correct. think that, I, I think that's, it's something like documentation, like uh, everyone is now, like a documentarist of his own, uh, That's of right. their own business. So yeah, I I, I help my help helped uh, my wife with her business recently. She's starting. She's also starting a business, and I'm noticing she gets a review, and I'm going to write a post about it and help her. Like it's something that I, I'm sure it, it's going to be taught sometime. Like how are you going yeah. to document your life and document your business? You know? That's right. Yeah. And the th the, you're right. And the thing is that if we solve a problem here in the business, then chances are there are going to be lots of other people around the world looking for the, a way to solve that same problem, right? So it's really simple if you just, you know, do some basic kind of optimization of the YouTube video or the post on your website to tap into the right kind of keywords so that when someone in the future is searching for, you know, how to program a pop-up um, opt-in box in Elementor. They end up on YouTube. There's one of our videos because we've used the right keywords. Um, but the other, the other trick is I think if you can make that documentation entertaining oh, in some way, that's the next then, level, definitely. Yeah, you get, you get more buy-in from your own team because you're not just giving them boring documentation. So they're enjoying the process and you get more buy-in from the community and you, you end up with more leads and more customers. Yeah, and if you make it funny, it's even better because people love yeah. to laugh. Yeah, of um, course, of course. Yeah, it, that's a huge thing. And um, I think for our audience is something, I mean, we kind of share a similar audience. I mean, I know mm. from talking to a lot of our community members, uh, uh, people that get drawn to Elementor are usually freelancers and um you know, small agencies, and that's kind of the people that go to your course. So can you tell us a, a bit about that audience? And uh, I, you call them web consultants and the, mm. the, the, how you reach from one, uh, like being a, a small web designer to developing to a web consultant and... Sure. <clears throat> so I think the, the, the definition for me of a WordPress consultant is someone who is building websites for clients using WordPress as their main weapon of choice. But someone who is maybe who is interested in not spending the rest of their life actually on the tools. So they're interested in the impact or the end result that this website has on their client's business. And most of the people that join our program are, are interested in how the website fits into the overall business strategy for the client. Most of our students are not just developers who are turning Photoshop files into WordPress themes. They might start off doing that, but they very quickly realize that in order to build a sustainable business long term, they need to be adding more value to their clients' businesses. And so that's part of the process that we take them through. Now, I think the reason that Elementor, I think the reason there's such a good fit between what we're doing and what you're doing is because, and I've thought long and hard about this, Elementor, as, as fantastic as it is as a page builder, it still requires the end user to have gone through the learning curve of mastering a self-hosted WordPress installation. And that is going to eliminate most um, hobby bloggers or most uh, people who just want to start a blog. I mean, if you just want to start a blog, you go to wordpress.com, right? And you can just start a blog at wordpress.com or you can even start a blog at Wix or Squarespace. And it's really easy. There's not much of a learning curve. But if you want to start hosting, if you want the flexibility of installing your own plugins and you want to really extend the functionality of your own website, you're going to have to get your head around 
a self-hosted install of WordPress. And that is quite a learning curve. And so what happens is the people that get through that learning curve, they end up with a specialist skill set that they realize is then valuable and they can effectively sell that skill set to other clients and they can start building websites for other clients. Now, Elementor fits in to that equation because I, I see Elementor as a great way of optimizing the manufacturing process, if you like, of a website. So instead of having to, you know, start a theme from scratch and, um, you know, build a whole bunch of, you know, funky custom post types and do a whole bunch of, you know, functions in the PHP. I mean, you can literally, I was just talking about my designer this, this afternoon at the branding agency. He's been playing with Elementor and Astra for the last three weeks based on the videos of ours that he's been watching on YouTube. And he said, dude, I can build a website. They, they've always outsourced their web dev to developers. He said, I can now build a website for clients in-house without touching any code. I said, exactly. I mean, if this was around 10 years ago when I started out, it would have been a whole other ball game. So I think as much as I think Elementor is great for WordPress users who are not building a business doing this for other clients, um, they're typically not our target audience. Our target audience are the people that have realized, okay, now that I have this knowledge and I've done it for myself, here's an opportunity to do this for other people and actually build a business building WordPress websites for clients and realizing that the WordPress website is just one part of the overall solution that they're providing. Because typically, when you launch a website for a client, within the coming weeks, the first bunch of questions you're going to get is, oh, okay, why am I not coming up on page one of Google? Yeah. So now all of a sudden, we're having a conversation about their SEO strategy. And so, oh, you know, what, what, what do we do with email marketing? And so now we're having a conversation about their email marketing strategy. Right? So can you talk a bit more about, beside, about the skill set of uh, those people besides building a self-hosted WordPress installation, which is something you can learn probably in uh, less than a day. So what kind yeah. of skills do you need to really start your business going uh, in terms of getting clients and uh, having an, an overall uh, effect? So, you know, you need, to, so it's a bit of a cliche, but, um, you know, we have two ears and one mouth, right? So you need to be a very good listener. You need to be able to under, you need, first of all, you need to be able to uh, figure out the type of client that you want to work with. And, and so I have a very simple criteria for, for working this out, right? Um, if I think about all the projects that I've done over the years, I ask myself this question. When I look back at every project, I say, was it fun? That's like the number one criteria for me. Was this a fun project to work on? Yes. Was it profitable? Sorry, that's the third question. Was it fun is the first question. The second question is, did I do good work? Yes. Was it profitable? Yes. If I answer yes to all of those questions, I say, right, that's the type of client I want to work with in the future. It's, they're fun to work with. I do good work and they're profitable. So therefore, let me tell you the types of projects I don't do. I don't do e-commerce anymore because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I will freely admit I am terrible at WooCommerce, so I don't do it anymore, right? Um, I don't work with companies that I, that I have no passion for what it is they're doing. Like I, I couldn't work with a company that just makes steel pipes for plumbers, for example, because I don't, I, I, there's no fire in my belly. I don't care about that at all, right? What I love about well, how you, you describe this is that you come from a, a more holistic approach and that's kind of how the, the place I'm going. I've, I've been in, the, you know, in the, this industry for a few years now and I know there are types of people that are, I would categorize them as um, you know, maybe data-driven or uh, SEO-oriented. You, you have a lot of names, but the idea is that they're eager to use as many tools and analyze things methodically. And mm -hmm. there's a place for that. I mean, that's ter amazingly helpful. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there's another type, maybe that are more the fit for web consultants, that are more interested in, they don't want a million tools. They don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, analyze uh, everything. Uh, that otherwise, they're more interested in strategy and in mm -hmm. business. So... How do you see the, the, the difference between those approaches? Yeah, so I, I think the, 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 the question that you need to ask yourself is, 
am I creating the most value that I possibly can for my client? And so that's why I don't work with companies that, that I don't find interesting or exciting because I'm not adding the most value because I'm kind of bored, right? Or I don't do e-commerce because I'm not very good at it. If I'm adding the most value to my clients and, and I, I geek out over the data sometimes and I love doing conversion rate optimization and, and all that kind of stuff, but I particularly like doing things like conversion rate optimization for charities or nonprofits who are trying to raise money for a cause, right? Because they they have more of a social conscience. They're not just selling widgets out the back of a factory. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, am I creating the most value possible for this client? Because the truth is the only way to position yourself as different from everyone else. And the only way to, I think to succeed, this is controversial, Ben, but the only way to succeed <laughs> as a WordPress consultant is to actually stop selling WordPress websites. You've got to change the conversation. You change the narrative. So WordPress is part of what we do, but we are providing you with a digital solution, a digital business strategy, and it includes WordPress. And internally, we have the conversation about the tools that we're going to use to deliver that product or that strategy to the client in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. And that's where something like Elemental fits right in because it helps us speed up our development workflow. But I'm not having a conversation with clients about Elementor. I'm not even having a conversation with clients about WordPress. I'm having a conversation with clients about what it is they need. Is there a good fit between what they need and what we do really well and what we, what we enjoy doing? And if there is, great. Then um, let's work on this project together and let's work as a team and let's knock it out of the park. I, th I think that's smart because there's now a proliferation of, uh, I would say, two types of um, ways to succeed. Okay, so there are, you know, the, the gurus that are more self-help oriented, you know, you have uh, your Tim Ferriss and uh, Tony Robbins and Gary Vishniak and all those. And on the other hand, you have the technical, uh, you know, teachers that are more inside the WordPress community. They're teaching everything like, uh, I think Pippin had a, a, some, uh, a course. And I think you're somewhere in the middle that is very mm. much needed because it balances both needs you do need to have the right motivation have the right mindset to succeed mm -hmm. but you also have to okay you have to start working and and uh, installing and doing all those technical things yeah so how do you see this balance <clears throat> yeah i mean <laughs> it's interesting to, uh i have been called the tony robbins of the wordpress space before <laughs> i have been referred to as that and that's okay i'm going to take that as a compliment um I, I'm probably a little less kind of rah-rah uh, uh, than, than Tony Robbins, but um, uh, I think it is all mindset for me. I, I, I mean, I, I went from, you know, building websites in my bedroom uh, for $1,200, which in Australia, by the way, if you build a website for $1,200, you're going you're gonna to be hungry and be poor very, very quickly. It's not sustainable. Australia is quite an expensive country to to live in. So I just want to acknowledge that for some people listening to this, they might think, wow, $1,200 is a lot of money for a website in Australia. It's not. And I went from building websites for $1,200 out of my spare bedroom and very quickly got to a place where I was building websites for 15, 20, $25,000. And I wasn't actually touching the code uh, because I was, in, in, you know, hiring developers and project managers to work with us on the projects. And the way that I did that was I, I wasn't delivering anything different. In fact, I realized that you have to work as hard to build a $500 website as you do to build a $5,000 website. The difference between the two is the client that ha has a $5,000 website actually has a business model and has the capacity to get a return on that $5,000 investment and values that $5,000 as an investment. Whereas the person building a $500 website or paying for a $500 website Typically speaking, they're taking that money out of their own savings account to pay for this website because they have some idea that they think might fly and they generally don't have a business model that's going to support getting a return on anything more than $500. And just because those clients exist and I have empathy for them and I want them to succeed doesn't mean I have to be the one to build the $500 website. Yeah. I can refer them somewhere else to get that job done. I can tell them to go to Upwork. I can tell them to go to, you know, Codable. Not that they're going to get a $500 website at Codable either, but I can tell them to go to a marketplace 
um, or to, you know, uh, manage the project themselves or to go to Wix or Squarespace and just do it themselves, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, and I hear this a lot. Oh, you know, I feel sorry for this client. They've only got $500 and I know I can help them. Yeah, you can, but you can't stay in business helping clients for $500 websites, right? In Australia, you can't. And in fact, I would say most of the developed world, you can't stay in business if you're building websites for $500. So for me, the deliverable didn't change. The only thing that changed was the conversation and the quality of the client that I was talking to. And the quality of the client changed because I started putting out content, educational content on the internet is a radical idea, but I started putting out educational content videos on the, on the internet and people started calling me up and emailing me saying, Hey, you seem to know a thing or two about this digital marketing thing. Can you help us? And I said, yes, I can. And we started working, we started filtering out clients, you know, and eventually we got to a point where we had an application form in our website and we stated very clearly, we don't do websites for anything less than $3,000. And then it was $5,000 and then it was $7,000 and then it was $10,000. So that was a period of time that we, we, um, we iterated on that, but it all started with us putting out the right type of content to attract the right type of clients to us rather than just saying yes to anyone who walked in the door. I totally agree that content is the, the right way to, I mean, when you're focused on the right audience, on, on the, you're trying to achieve the, the, the top of the, of the mark, you're going to have to attract attention other than cold calling and, and, and selling them. And I think content is, is great. I, I, I think actually that, that video is great because I'm seeing people that started out, uh, people in our community like Dave Foy and uh, Adam Pricer mm-hmm. and, the, and, and yourself, the achievements they've made in video, I don't think that you can compare it to any other uh, medium. But the thing is, uh, because I'm having a lot of conversation with people from our community, some people find it hard to be on camera. Mm-hmm. So how do you bridge the, the gap? Someone who's eager, he has everything he wants to, 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 mm. to, to, to be the best success that, that he can be. Yeah. Uh, how can you give uh, them the, the, what can they do? If they, if they don't have the natural, you know, the, they don't, look as, as well on screen like you do and, and speak. To them <laughs> and, uh... Well, there's a couple of things. Um, uh, first of all, you know, never compare where you are today with where someone else is who's been doing it for 10 years, right? That's rule number one. Never compare yourself to anyone else because I will watch videos that I make now and compare them to videos that other people are making who are, in much larger organizations with me with much more revenue and much more resources. And if I spend too much time comparing what I'm doing now with what they're doing, I just feel bad about what I'm doing and I get depressed and then I don't want to get on camera, right? Because I feel like I'm not as good. So never compare yourself to anyone else. The second thing is the only way to overcome, the only way to get better at anything is practice, right? So give yourself permission to make a video and then never show anyone. And know that when you first start making videos and you watch them back, you are going to hate them and you are going to suck at it, right? So give yourself permission to suck at it. Um, and the third, and, uh, but just keep practicing and keep doing it. And the third thing I'll say is this, and I actually heard this on a podcast by Amy Porterfield. Uh, she said every time she gets uh, self-conscious about making video, one of her coaches said to her, you have to remember, it's not about you. It's about your audience and you have a message to share. So if you don't make this video, you are doing your audience a disservice by keeping your message from them. So just get out of your own way for a minute and share your message with your audience. So they're the three mindset tricks that I would, you know, and and I haven't always been this confident or this relaxed on camera. When I first started out, I, you know, like anyone, I wasn't very good at it. And it's just taken me a long time to get this confident and this relaxed. Well, that's a great answer. And it raised an, another question for me is people starting out uh, just, you know, maybe they made a few websites for their family and they, they're thinking about maybe I can do this for a living. Maybe I can quit my job as a waitress or whatever and, and, and do this for a living. When you want to create content, that's great if you have clients and you, as, as we spoke, you can talk about it. If you're trying to create 
um, content from, from scratch, from zero, with, and you don't have clients, I think what usually people do is like, okay, let's risk keyword research, everything that's related to WordPress, let's start writing about it. Or, yeah. you know, and it's kind of, you know, they get lost because of course it's overwhelming and it's not genuinely coming from a place that they have experience for. So yeah. what kind of advice would you give them? Well, I, I tell you exactly because we have just been through and it feels like you've set me up here to answer this question, but I just want to tell everyone, we, I did not know you were going to ask this question. Right? <laughs> we have just been through this keyword research exercise here ourselves and we've spent a lot of time and a fair bit of money going over the keyword research. And here's the thing that I have found and here's the thing that I fundamentally believe about the WordPress space and about digital marketing in general when it comes to keyword research. One is it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely little bubble for all of us to live in, but that's what it is. It's a very, very, very small bubble. So if you start doing keyword research around WordPress, for example, you'll find there might be a handful of keywords that get any kind of search volume a month, right? That, that, that is worth mentioning, right? There's, there's, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of keywords that get hardly any search volume. And there's very few keywords that get a lot of search volume. And I can tell you the keyword that gets the most search volume in the WordPress space is WordPress login. Because people, you, I mean, you, you just think that through to its natural conclusion, right? People have got a WordPress site. They go to Google and they go WordPress login. They want to know how to log into their WordPress site. Now, I think most of those people are on WordPress.com, not WordPress.org. So that's interesting. Um, second of all, this space is changing so quickly, man, that by the time you figure out a keyword that's worth ranking for, it's done. Right? It's moved on, right? So I think, for, for me anyway, our approach now is to produce content that we need answers for ourselves because chances are that if we need the answer, then other WordPress consulting firms need the answer. Um, to produce content that is shareable, that people will want to share. So it's got to be high quality, it's got to be educational, and it's got to be entertaining. Sometimes we get all those three right. Sometimes we miss the mark. But, you know, I think we do a pretty good job. Um, and then we reach out to the people that we mention in those videos and we say, hey, Ben, we thought you might like this video about using Elementor to build rapid prototypes and, you know, feel free to share it with your audience. And then you link back to us and that is our organic SEO strategy. I've done a lot of work on keyword research in this space and I don't think there's enough search volume around particular keywords to produce content for keywords. Now, that doesn't mean that keywords and SEO is not important. I think once you've produced a flagship piece of content, you can then optimize it for certain key phrases and keywords and you can produce a whole bunch of other satellite content that points back to your cornerstone flagship piece as the authority piece and that is definitely a strategy worth pursuing um, but if you look at the 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 top wordpress uh ranking um, articles for wordpress related things it's general they're generally ranking for digital marketing or general digital digital business terms not wordpress specific terms so i don't know if that answers your question but that's kind of where i stand on the whole I, you know keyword research agree, topic i think that uh i want to strengthen what, what you're saying i think that if you're doing content that you're engaged with then your content will be richer because you'll have the examples. You'll, you'll, it'll just, you'll be aligned with what you're doing and that way your content will be better. So people think about how can I create great content? Okay, it needs to be 3,000 words with media, with images. No, it, yeah. needs to be, it needs to align with what you're passionate about and hopefully you're passionate about your work. Uh, if not, you change your work. But uh, Correct. So then, then leverage that. That's right. And so I think you can optimize a post <clears throat> with making sure you've got, you know, images with alt tags, that, that you've got, you know, subheadings, that you've got, you know, bullet pointed lists, that the, the, the post is readable, that it flows well, that it reads well, that it's entertaining, that it's engaging. I think you can do all of those things with a post, but I don't think you should start producing content just to satisfy a keyword uh, search. I think you should produce content that you are gen genuinely passionate about and then optimize it for any relevant keywords that people might be searching for. Uh, because the other thing, the other thing to bear in mind is that 
every day, I, don't, I can't remember what the percentage is, but every day there is a ridiculously high percentage of searches done in Google for the first time ever. So that is, no one has ever searched for this before. Every day there are yeah. millions of searches done in Google for the first time. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's impossible to stay ahead of that curve. I, 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 had to ask, I have to ask you, because it's very interesting to me, um, I think there's something similar between how Elementor grew and how your company grew and will keep growing in the fact that you have a lot in the WordPress community, you have a lot of like um, uh, plugins that are owned by, you know, someone, one single developer and they're constrained. They're not built as a company, meaning they, mm-hmm. they, they're not built to scale and they, they don't give both in terms of branding and in terms of, of actuality, they don't give the, the feeling of, of here's a company who is behind mm. this and you, you can feel safe with it. Mm. So can you speak about, about what it's like? I mean, it's a broad question because I, I'm also interested in how you actually manage to, 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 to create this, this feeling of it's a company and we're, mm. it's a, you have a global company with employees around the world, audience around the world. Yeah. I mean, it started out, uh, we had a plugin called the video user manuals plugin, uh, which is a, a plugin that puts a bunch of video tutorials in your client's dashboard to teach them how to use WordPress. And so we start and we have a free p- plugin called white label CMS, which allows you to completely white label WordPress. So we started building an email list. Just two of us, myself, and my business partner started building an email list off the free plugin and then started building a list of customers off the video user manuals plugin. And after a couple of years, we, we, we spent no time on that, man. We spent like a couple of hours every Tuesday morning on Skype just having a chat about things and having a look at our Google Analytics and then not really doing anything and not really knowing what to do next. But after a few years, I'm going to say like maybe three or four years, the video user manuals plugin was doing about 120 grand a year in recurring revenue. And so we looked at it and went, wow, um, like we spend no time on this thing at all and it's doing 120 grand a year in recurring. What could we do if we actually paid attention to this and, and, and put some effort into it? So we start, so for the first time ever, we started emailing our list and asking them what they wanted and they overwhelmingly came back and told us that they wanted business coaching. They wanted to learn how to grow their business. They wanted to learn how we wrote proposals. They wanted to learn, you know, people would, people knew that I was involved in the video use manuals plugin. They would go check out my website. They would have a look at some of the clients I'd work with. They'd say, how do you land these clients? How do you run the meeting when you first turn up? What, what questions do you ask? How do you write a proposal? How do you, do you keep talking about prototypes? What are they? How do you do them? Um, you know, how do you get your clients on maintenance plans and how do you get referrals? And all these questions kept coming in via email. And I'm like, you know what? there are enough people asking the same questions that we can turn this into a course or a a business coaching program. So in 2013, we launched and five years later, um, we're now uh, eight full-time staff and another 22 contractors around the world who touch the business on a, a, almost a daily basis. We have videographers, video editors, um, copywriters, um, uh, you know, blog writers, project managers, coaches, mentors, SEO, you know, uh, we have a chairman of the board. We just appointed a chairman of the board to and basically also, help mentor. You increase the, the frequency of your courses, right? Yeah. So we, we, yeah. So we, we, um, we, we, up until recently, up, well, up until now, we've been having three launches um, a year. Uh, um, in June, we'll have our fourth launch. Uh, for this financial year. Um, our financial year in Australia here is July to June. Um, and we've also been putting the price up. Um, and the reason that we've been putting the price up is because we have more staff and more coaches and we create more value in the course and we have greater support mechanisms for our students. Um, and the truth is now that this business on, a, on, the, on an operational level, the business runs almost without me. Uh, I occasionally will run a coaching call uh, and 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 uh, help people through the questions with uh, with Simon, the uh, the other coach here in Australia, and so we'll help our students get through the blueprint. But the marketing side of things, the operations, the um, customer success manager, our customer support tickets—that's all managed by the team. So my job now is to help grow the business, 
uh, and help expand the business so that we can help more people. But I'm not actually on the tools doing the, the things that I was doing three years ago, which is a good thing, Ben, because <laughs> up, until, up until a couple of years ago, if I got hit by a bus, then all of our students would be at risk because I wouldn't be here to help them. Right. And so part of me really wanting to build some structure and build a team in this business is to de-risk the business against me being the, the only key person of influence. So I can now step away from the business if I get sick or I got hit by a bus. I could be away from the business for six weeks and the business still creates value for its customers and still generates a profit for the business, which is a good pl- that's a good space to be in. So how do you manage your time? Like how do you focus uh, your own time on? <laughs> <laughs> you make a dangerous assumption that I know how to focus and that I know how to manage my time, Ben. <laughs> you have so much on your plate. I do have a lot on my plate. Um, it's, a, it's a daily practice trying to work out what to prioritize. Um, I mentioned before, we've just appointed a chairman of the board here and his role really is to mentor myself and my business partner through this next stage of growth so that we can... Uh, so that you know he can help us help keep us accountable, but you know what it, it, it's really simple until you complicate things right yeah there are you know what I mean there are really only like there are really only like three things that you need to be focused on every day at Definitely. this stage you know for me and and like so every day if you get three big tasks done, then yeah, you yeah. should go home right I totally um, agree and and yeah. I look at the areas of the business and I say okay how's marketing doing? How are we doing from a marketing standpoint? Um, how are we doing from a customer uh, service standpoint? We call it customer success. So are our existing customers happy? Yep. So that's customer success. Marketing is, are we attracting new customers to the program? Yes. And then the third question is, how's the team doing? Is everyone happy on the team? Um, that's cool. Th- they're kind of three big questions I think about every day. You know, they're the three things that keep me awake at night. That's cool. And How do you follow up on on your uh, on your cu- on your customers your students and what kind of results are are you seeing like feedback yeah that's a that's a great question man so we've got a couple of metrics here in the business that we uh, use to measure the I'm just waving goodbye to our customer success manager Jean who's walking out the door um, we have a couple of metrics that we use in the business here to measure how well we're doing in serving our customers one is the net promoter score so which is, uh, you probably are familiar with it, but for those that aren't, it's a very simple question. It's a one question survey you send your customers and you say, on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend your friends to WP Elevation? The usual net promo, and you can score anywhere from minus 100 to positive 100. That's the scale where your score can sit, depending on whether people give you, you know, what score they give you. And if you want to learn more about that, people should Google net promoter score because it's actually quite a, there's a great science behind it. And I really believe that it's a, a good metric to let you know how you're tracking with your existing customers. So the, the benchmark for a business like ours, which is kind of business to business coaching and education, the benchmark for our business is around about 40. So if you're getting about 40 out of anywhere from minus 100 to a positive 100, if you're sitting at positive 40, then you're on track. Our current net promoter score is 84. Uh, so I know we're doing really well. And the people that say that they wouldn't recommend us, the reason that they say that is because they don't want their competitors to find out about <laughs> WP Elevation. Right, so the other metric that we measure is our course completion rates. Out of, out of all the people that join up for our course, how, what percentage of people actually complete the course within three months of joining us? And we know that most online courses have course completion rates of around about anywhere from two to ten percent. In fact, the, the more people that you have enrolled in a course, the lower your course completion rate. So I some of the really a master master class and I didn't finish there you go. Two, two classes. <laughs> there you go. So uh, the, the really large universities that put their courses up online, they have completion rates of about two percent. And that's because the online environment, you, you can't replicate. A classroom by just putting it online there are things that you need to take into consideration and it all comes down to the user experience or the, the customer experience the student experience and so we work really hard to nurture our students through the course a lot of people sell an online course and then when you enroll they're like hey thanks very much I've got your money and I'm gonna go sit on the beach 
uh, we know that when you enroll in our course, that's when our work begins because you've trusted us enough to make an investment in the course. It's now our responsibility to make sure you implement and you get results. So our course completion rates at, this, at the moment are about 65%. So if 65% of our students who enroll in the course complete the course within three months, they graduate, they get their certificate, they print it out, they take a photo and they put it in our Facebook group and it's an incredible um, sense of, of reward and it's a great big virtual hug that the community give them to, to congratulate them for uh, completing the course. Now, to follow that through to its logical conclusion to answer your question, some of the results that we get, and I can speak, you know, um, firsthand experience, whenever I travel and I meet people who have been through the WP Elevation program, um, usually the, the story, and I can tell you an example of, of Chris and Amber Hines, who I met at WordCamp US in Philadelphia a couple of years ago, um, and Robert and Alyssa Simmons, who I met in our mastermind in Miami last year, both came up to me when they met me in real life and said, I want to thank you so much because as a result of going through WP Elevation, the husbands have been able to quit their full-time job, work from home in the business full-time with their wives, and they are living the dream because they get to spend all day, every day at home with their wife and some, in some cases their children running this business from home and they're not trudging off to a job that, they, that makes them miserable anymore. I can't put a value on that. I don't know what that's worth, but I know that that's what gets me out of bed every day. That, the so success sad. stories and the, yeah, it's totally satisfying and, and that is worth more than any amount of money you could put in our bank account. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Uh, I think we can kind of wrap things up. I want to ask you what you're, currently working on and what you want to share about uh, what's new? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we, when we launched the WP Elevation course, when we remodeled it and relaunched it uh, three years ago, it w people were logging in and they were blown away by how beautiful the interface was and, um, and how amazing uh, it is. And it still is when people log in for the first time now, it's amazing. If you've, for me, I see it every day. And for me, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, what, do, what can we do next? Like, how can we innovate? How can we make it uh, even a better experience? So I'll give you one very specific example that we're working on. If you watch one of the videos in one of the modules in our course, and you're like, I know our videos are pretty short, by the way, they're only about, you know, eight to 10 minutes each. But if you watch a video and you're like halfway through it, and the doorbell goes and you're like, ah, oh, I gotta go, I'm gonna watch this later. And maybe you leave the house and then you get on the train and then you open the, the, the website on your phone. At the moment, you kind of gotta go back and watch that video from the start again, right? So we're working on, and I know this can be done and we're exploring different options now, but I wanna improve the experience so much that when you get on the train and you play that video, it just picks up from where you left off. It's like net Netflix. And, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, like Netflix, right? Um, and 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 there's there's a whole bunch of other things that we're working on which it really are designed to allow you so we're working on some ideas for some sms bots um some chat bots and also uh we've we've built the first prototype of and i haven't never announced this publicly ben so this is a coup um we've we've actually built the very first prototype of our our very own desktop app um which is not available just yet uh, but the desktop app will kind of be like Google Drive or Dropbox. And so, uh, for example, when one of our community members writes a new proposal template for, you know, marketing funnels and they contribute that to the program and it gets approved and it officially gets added to one of our official resources, then it automatically just syncs to your desktop and you go, oh, wow, WP Elevation, there's a new marketing funnel proposal template. Instead of having to log into the member's website and get the updates and go find it, we nice. can just stream these documents directly to your to your desktop. So they're the kinds of things that we're constantly thinking about how we improve the experience for our students and how we help them implement what we teach them so that it's not just information, it's actually implementation. I, I love your strive for uh, perfection. It's really uh, admirable. Um, and uh, how can people reach you and, uh, you know, start the course? Can you uh, share? Yeah, so the best place is to come over to WPElevation.com um, or hit us up on Facebook. Uh, we're very active on Facebook and we monitor our, our chat and our messages uh, very, um, very diligently. Uh, WPElevation.com slash Facebook. You can check out some of our live stream videos um, or the website WPElevation.com. Uh, at the moment, I'm not sure when this goes uh, live, but uh, we are open, I think, the first week of June. Um, so come, you know, end of May, early June, you'll be able to enroll in the program. 
That's cool. Thank you, Troy. It's been fun and enlightening. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to do a lot of uh, more things together. Uh, so uh, until next time, thank you, everyone, and uh, see, you, see you later. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Ben.